It's time to focus our attention on the head butler of Nazrik and the commander of the Pleiades' six sisters, Sibas Chin. But I'm sure you already knew that. So let's do as we usually do and find out who exactly is Sebas, the Iron Butler, by looking at everything from his lore and creation to all the external elements that influence his character. But first, before we get into the details, a lot of you ask in the comments where you can find a game like Overlord's Yggdrasil. Coincidentally enough, I think I may have found one for you. Kakao Games, the publishers of Black Desert Online, was kind enough to sponsor this video. But I honestly do feel that if you like Overlord, then Black Desert Online might be your cup of tea. It's an immersive action-packed MMORPG that has one of the most in-depth crafting systems to date, a beautifully designed massive open world with gorgeous landscapes and environments, as well as a character creation tool with an unbelievable scope of customizability across 16 diverse classes, each with their own unique skills and abilities. You could very well recreate every Overlord character if you had the artistic ability. I tried to recreate Sibas as a striker, but I don't think I quite nailed it. My brain model on the other hand looks a little bit better, I think. Anyway, the game is constantly being updated with new classes, smaller content additions, and even large scale expansions, like the most recent Dragon expansion with over 300 new quests and a new sinister dragon boss, or the newly revealed male ranger archer class who sports a crossbow as his main weapon and a variety of ranged magic skills and attacks. For me though, I think the game's most fun aspect is its fluid real-time action-based combat. It feels a lot smoother and more fleshed out than other games that have played, and there's certainly a lot of skills and techniques to be learned that make playing as any character an enjoyable experience. I can only imagine how crazy the guild PvP battles can get. So if you're interested in checking out Black Desert Online, you can use the link in the description to sign up and get a 7-day free trial so you can find out for yourself if this is the MMORPG for you. Now, let's get back into the video. As the head butler, Sebas is effectively in charge of all the male servants of Nazarick, like the assistant butler Eclair 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 and his 10 man servants. By contrast, Pestonia S. Wanko is the head maid in charge of the 41 homunculus maids. Presumably, Sebas's duties as head butler entail coordinating with the maids, specifically the head maid Pestonia, in scheduling and assigning the 52 plus underlings they have between them to ensure that the 9th and 10th floors of the guild were well kept and cleaned as Nazarick's standards demanded. But after Pistonia was placed into confinement, Sebes took over what would have been her role in training Suare to become a proper duty maid of Nazarick. This suggests that there is enough overlap between his specialties as head butler and Pistonia's specialty as head maid, since he could train Suare to the exacting standards demanded of the homunculus maids of Nazarick. Now, I could go over all the tasks and responsibilities that the homunculus maids have, but I think I'll save that for a video dedicated to Nazarick itself. For now, I think it's best to just know that they were responsible for cleaning and maintaining the throne room, its connecting hallways, each individual room of the Supreme Ones, and the guest rooms, day in and day out. Although Sebas does help to oversee them, his primary duty is not to serve drinks or clean Nazarick. Remember, he is also the commander of the combat maids, and as such, is skilled at both combat and maid-like duties. When Sebas is in charge of the group, they're called the Pleiades Six Stars, derived from a six-pointed star in astrology each representing one of the six combat maids. Yuri Alpha is second in command, and the chain of command after that proceeds down the line by order of age and Greek letter. It goes Lupus Regina Beta, Nabrila Gamma, Shizu Delta, Solution Epsilon, and finally Entoma Vasilla Zeta. As you may have heard before, Oriel Omega is the final sister and member of the Pleiades. When she's the one in command of the group, they're simply called the Pleiades Seven Sisters, named after the seven daughters of the Greek Titan Atlas. We've seen very little of her in the light novel so far, and all major references of her were cut entirely from the anime. But I'm sure eventually Jin4 and I will get to making a video on her too. In any case, the sole duty of the Pleiades combat maids back in Yggdrasil was to serve as a final line of defense to buy Ainz and the surviving members of Ainz Ulgon time in order to gather and meet them in the throne room. As a group of level 60 or so NPCs and a single level 100 NPC, they had no chance of actually stopping any group of players who were capable of breaching the defenses of all floors of Nazarick, particularly one that could overcome these specialized defenses on the 8th floor. But as we've discussed earlier, the bulk of the guild NPCs in Nazarick were made for gimmick or roleplay purposes, and only a few levels were dedicated to NPCs who were actually intended to guard something. The combat maids were made with the excuse of being the last line of defense, 
But the real reason? It was probably because the guild members wanted an excuse to design some cute combat mains. But let's be honest though, can you blame them? Now before I get sidetracked and start talking about all the combat maids, we're here to talk about Sebas, not them. However, you know I can't do that yet because we first have to talk about his creator, Touch Me. If you remember from my Who is Pandora's Actor video, Touch Me was the former leader of Ein's Ulgon back when it was known as Nine's Own Goal. He was the one who brought the original guild together. What was not so thoroughly explained is why he acts the way that he does, as a shining example of a hero who helps others as if he's all might. You see, Touch Me idolized the concept of a hero character, and valued virtues like righteousness, kindness, and honesty above all. His motto was simple, the strong should protect the weak. It wasn't a naive idealism either. Much like the paladin class archetype that he adopted, he believed in the fundamental importance of having the skills and strength to protect and enforce your moral view of the world. He was amazing at PvP, with reflexes and mechanics that could not be matched, and with this strength, he protected the fledgling members of Ein's Ulgon from getting PK'd repeatedly, and built the guild into the global powerhouse that it would eventually become. He was by far the best PvPer in the guild, and among the top in the entire server winning one of the World Tournament Championships held once per year by the server, and earning himself access to one of the restricted and highly exclusive World Champion classes. Touch Me thus represents an interesting duality that's present in the Superman archetype. He is both a being of great power, but also a being who voluntarily and wholeheartedly sought to use his strength for the benefit of others and not himself. Perhaps it was his affinity for such tropes that led him to create the combat butler, Sebas Chan. Sebas is meant to be the archetype of all things Butler, from his looks to his personality, even down to his name. Yes, when you put together his first and last name, you get Sebastian. It's a bit of a trope in anime, and Japanese media in general, that Butlers are called Sebastian. The most well-known example, and quite possibly the trope starter, would be Black Butler's titular character, Sebastian Michaelis. But just to reinforce the point a bit more, there's a Sebastian in Penguin Musume Heart, Inukami, Five Brain Puzzle of God, Doki Doki Precure, as well as the video games Tekken, Soikoiden 3, and It Nier. Even parodies of this naming convention arose through shows like Lucky Star where butler-type characters would be referred to as Sebastian even though that wasn't their real name. But as you can no doubt tell from these images, butlers in Japanese media usually have some combination of grey hair, a moustache, a black suit, and a fairly muscular build, if not all four at once. Sometimes the butlers are merely stewards for their charge, though occasionally they are combat butlers, highly trained ex-military special operatives or mystic warriors of supernatural power who are hired to protect their charge from murder and violence, not just serve them lunch or chaperone them around. Honestly, the combat butler trope is even more widespread than the Sebastian name trope and can be found across the world. It actually stems from how the real life British military used to work, so you know what that means. Let's briefly look into that with yet another Animus history lesson. Back in the heyday of the British Empire, commissioned officers in the British military routinely came from extremely rich families. After all, they were commissioned by the government to do important work for the crown, and such duties could only be given to trusted aristocrats from the ruling class, or so the logic went. As such, they would routinely be appointed soldiers to act as servants, or sometimes they would have their servants enlist as soldiers and be appointed to their command. It was so common, in fact, that the position of an officer's servant became permanent and actually survived all the way to the mid-20th century through World War II, even when the majority of officers stopped being royalty. In any case, these individuals would perform a variety of duties as both soldier and servant, including acting as a runner to relay orders, maintaining and cleaning their officer's uniform and equipment, acting as their personal bodyguard in combat, and so on. The position was usually seen as quite desirable and prestigious. This idea that butlers were frequently these badass, highly trained, and competent ex-soldiers who enjoyed a friendly relationship with their master as a result of bonding during their military career became a popular subject of stories and fiction. Nowadays, most butler characters in fiction have an ex-military background of some sort. Prime example, Alfred Pennyworth. Japan, as they usually do, took this trope and ran with it. In Western countries, the butler may be a servant, but they're usually portrayed as a trusted confidant and friend. Japan tends to emphasize the notions of servitude more, whereas the West has historically valued individualism, freedom, and self-reliance. 
In Japan, as in many Asian countries, shifts towards such things have been slower because their culture values different traits. It's still customarily expected for those in the serving industry to patiently accept whatever orders or verbal abuse they receive from those that they are serving. Similarly, employees at a business aren't supposed to complain to their boss or protest difficult working conditions. Basically, Japan still values traditional notions of servitude from a cultural perspective. A servant, after all, is not supposed to have opinions, expectations, ego, or emotions. They're supposed to devote their effort and energy to serving the whims and ego of their master. It's no surprise then, the idea of maids and butlers took off in Japan and we saw the rise of things like maid cafes. Of course, it's not because everyone in Japan is a heartless monster or something, just because they don't like individualism and freedom. There's obviously something innately and intrinsically attractive about someone else working to benefit your well-being and happiness because they genuinely enjoy doing so, or at least they appear to. Like a mother's love for their young child, servants are supposed to have such a willingness to sacrifice their own happiness, well-being, and ego for their master that it almost appears to be like love. People naturally enjoy being the subject of others' attention and concern. The combat butler trope adds Gap Moe on top of this. There's something even more compelling about a dutiful servant who will do anything you ask for them without complaint and devote their entire life for you. But they can also take on a squad of a dozen ninjas while simultaneously preparing a cup of tea and scheduling your day for you. Japan already had the concept of the Yamato Nadeshiko, the traditional Japanese ideal for a woman. One that was gentle, patient, and servile to the men in her family, but also possessing a steel wit, wisdom, and the conviction needed to assist them during their toughest times, not just be a pretty wallflower. Combat butlers and combat maids are just the same concept, but with a western skin. Like I said, it's the Superman trope. Characters with great strength and competence who behave as if they were servants whose talents existed to help others. It was these kinds of characters that Touch Me liked the best most likely leading to Sibas, who I'm sure I'll return to talking about specifically really soon. Though all of what I've just said about combat butlers basically applies to Sibas as well. He's not exactly an ex-soldier, but he is a badass warrior, so close enough. It's never really explained why Touch Me liked combat butlers specifically, though we can infer that it was attributed to being a fan of the hero-servant concept. But honestly, it doesn't even need to be that complicated. You have to keep in mind that Nazarick's Supreme Ones, back when they played Yggdrasil, were for the most part gamers and otaku, in addition to being working class adults. People like Ulbert Elaine Odal or Tabula Smaragdina, who were interested in the occult and western mythology were the exception, rather than the rule. For the most part, members of Ainz Ulgon were influenced by anime tropes and Japanese culture, and they created things that reflected those influences, whether it be maids, traps, cute girls, or in Touchme's case, combat butlers. He didn't necessarily give him a fancy backstory, a unique name, or a complex personality, because of course not all people are interested in making complex, fully-fledged characters. As a matter of fact, apparently even his general facial features were modeled after his own appearance in real life. Put simply, he wanted to make something that would look like, act like, and think like an ordinary run-of-the-mill combat butler trope, serving his master faithfully and dutifully with a stern but gentle expression on his face. Why? Well, just like the reasons for many of the other NPC creations. It's because he thought it was cool. Really. You can see these same themes shared across the entirety of Nazarick. They're all rocking that combat servant theme. Generally, fiction writers tend to write what you know in the sense that they write the best when they're writing about what they're most interested in or speaking from personal experience or first-hand knowledge. The author of Overlord, Maruyama, wanted to write a story with Gat Moe, Combat Maids, Creepy Monsters, and Yandere Sakube. But rather than try and shoehorn in a lame excuse for all these things to appear in the story, he created a complex cast of characters who are otaku and had the justification be that they liked these things and they wrote it in their own story. It's a really clever way to lampshade the trope by openly acknowledging that half your characters were made specifically to be pandering to otaku fetish material. Okay, but seriously, let's talk about Sibas now. I didn't want to bore you about things you probably already knew, like what kind of character Sibas was. He's as stereotypical of a combat butler as they come. I figure it'd be more interesting to explain why he was written that way, both from the perspective of Touch Me who created the character and also from the author of the book. So let's talk about the aspects of Sebas's character that are a bit more subtle and a bit more interesting. 
namely the conflict that Sebas has between his nature as a servant of Nazarek and his nature as the creation of Touch Me. Sebas, like all creations of Nazarek, is a loyal servant who sees himself as having no other purpose in life than to do his creator's every bidding. But Sebas, like all other creations of Nazarek, adopts the personality of his creator in ways that aren't strongly defined in his lore, backstory, or game mechanics. Most of the denizens of Nazarek are evil aligned, and they view other creatures with, at best, complete apathy, and at worst, abject loathing and hatred, though a select few have a more neutral or pragmatic outlook. Sebes is one of the few Nazarek denizens who are known or strongly implied to be good aligned, alongside Yuri Alpha, Pistonia, and Nigretto. In fact, he has the highest karma rating of any known denizen at 300. A good aligned karma rating typically indicates someone who will feel morally obligated to go out of their way to help innocents or strangers, and who find evil acts distasteful. Sebas actually takes this a step further, adopting the full lawful good archetype of the paladin his creator played as, meaning not only should the strong protect the weak, the strong should also punish and destroy evil, as he swiftly demonstrates during his ruthless purge of the Six Fingers. To Sebas, the conduct of many of these individuals, such as Constable Stefan, marked them as no better than animals or insects, and thus deserving of the same treatment as a rabid dog. Others, like the Guards of the Brothel or the Six Arms members, were complicit in those acts, and thus just as morally culpable. But more importantly, he found their hubris and self-confidence insufferable. It's as if he expects those with genuine power to maintain the same kind of humility and grace that he does and that his creator seemed to idolize, which is probably why he becomes good acquaintances with Climb and Brain. Ironically, Sebes' righteous indignation and outright hatred for criminals and other scumbags whom he views as literally inhuman makes him surprisingly similar to the evil Nazarek denizens, in a sense. They too see those outside of Nazarek as fundamentally lesser creatures that do not deserve their lives, though the evil Nazarek NPCs are much less selective about who actually deserves what. That's not to say that they think everyone is beneath them. Regardless of karma rating, level, race, or position, a Nazarek denizen understands that their only job is to serve the edicts of the Supreme Ones, and that they are each deserving of a fundamental level of respect as fellow creations, for to disrespect a creation can be seen as a slight against their creator. Fundamentally speaking, the Supreme Ones exist at the top as the gods and rulers, with the NPCs at the bottom as their loyal servants and creations, and everything else that isn't from Nazarek aren't even on the scale. Nazarek's servants share an affinity with each other, and view each other roughly as equals regardless of their position. After all, to think that one particular creation is fundamentally superior to another is to, in a sense, belittle one of the creators. Even a Claire, who seems to be made for the express purpose of being incompetent in every conceivable way, is not fundamentally a lesser creature because of this, though sometimes other NPCs do find it difficult to treat him with all due respect. Even if two creations would otherwise hate each other, both good and evil NPCs can cooperate to serve the Supreme Ones. For example, though Sibes can barely stand Demiurge's personality, he ultimately respects the fact that he can contribute to the glory of Ein's Oogon. And aside from uniting around their shared identity as fellow creations, some are even compelled by their specific lore settings or personal background to maintain relationships that may be contrary to their moral code. Look at Yuri Alpha. Though she finds the behavior of some of her more evil and sadistic sisters to be disappointing and exasperating, she still loves them, as they were all written to enjoy a healthy and respectful relationship with each other. Still, there are a few exceptions to this rule, such as Shaltir and Albedo's or Demiurge and Sebas's. No, the two of them don't actually fight, but they do regularly take low-key jabs at each other, and interact sarcastically and passive-aggressively sometimes. Part of the reason behind the conflict between Sebas and Demiurge is rooted in the conflict between their creators. After all, servants strongly take after their creators, both in the things they like and the things they can't stand. You'll recall that Touch Me was the kind of person who valued justice and righteousness. This frequently put him in conflict with Ulbert Elaine Odell, the creator of Demiurge, who was obsessed with role-playing as a villain. The stark contrast between their personalities was part of the reason why Touch Me ultimately stepped down as the guild leader, and appointed Momonga in his place. The two had argued so often and so emotionally that one of the founding members of Nine's own goal actually left the guild as a result and there was this lingering sense of bad blood between the two of them that lasted for quite some time. 
Quite unlike the paladin class archetype that he played as, he wasn't a blind zealot and was capable of recognizing and acknowledging how his personality and actions had led to this conflict and had caused some of the very suffering that he wished to eradicate in the rest of the guild members. In any case, good-natured Nazarek servants still sometimes find faithful, diligent service to the Supreme Ones to be quite difficult to square with their sense of morality. Sebas found himself unable to resist saving Suare during the events of Season 2 despite knowing in the back of his mind that she was a potential risk and liability that could jeopardize his mission. He even took steps to conceal her existence by refusing to mention her as part of his regularly scheduled reports. He believed he would have been told to abandon her where he found her, and he just couldn't bring himself to do that. Deep down, he knew what he was doing could be seen as a potential betrayal that could put his mission at risk. But as soon as it became clear that the worst case scenario might come to pass, he decided almost immediately to accept the risks and consequences with the conviction to resolve any problems that arose, up to and including executing Suare on command. His greatest fear when being confronted by Ainz in Season 2 was not that Suare would be killed, but that he might be executed immediately upon presenting himself to Ainz, and forever be branded as this traitor to Nazarek long after he had passed. Nazarek denizens value loyalty to the creators and the Supreme Ones above all else, Sure, they'll find ways to do what they want if it still allows them to accomplish the orders that they've been given, and some of them may indulge in some willful delusion to do so. But betrayal is fundamentally only possible in the context of magical compulsion, such as in the case with Shaltir. Anyway, that's pretty much everything I've got on Sibas lore-wise, and then some. Next time will be on how strong he is. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and thank you to Kakao Games for sponsoring this video. Don't forget, you can use the link in the description to get a free 7-day trial to Black Desert Online. But until next time, ciao!